In this video, we're going to talk about Newton's three laws of motion. The first law states, an object will maintain its current state of motion unless that object is acted upon by a force. The state of motion that we're referring to could mean the object is moving at a constant velocity, or it could mean the object is at rest. Let's look at an example. Here we have a shot of a boulder resting on a hill. Let's watch Newton's first law in action. Not that exciting, is it? We can see that the boulder is not moving, and thus it's obeying Newton's first law. It's maintaining its current state of motion. So why don't we look at another example? Here's a top view of a hockey rink. It's actually really tough to have a good example of an object moving at a constant velocity. Uh, because on Earth we have friction and we have air resistance. So this is really probably the best situation we could have uh, is a hockey puck on some fresh ice. The ice is nearly frictionless and so the puck, if it was traveling down the ice, will maintain traveling in a straight line at a constant velocity unless it's acted upon by another force, like a goalie stopping the puck at the other end. Now Newton's first law is also the reason we need to wear seat belts. If you were driving down the road and you were to get in a car accident like this guy is about to do, hits the tree and stops, the person would continue on moving at the velocity it was originally traveling at. Now if this person was wearing a seatbelt, we would have the person be able to stay inside the vehicle. As soon as it hit, the seatbelt would hold them in place. So since the person and the vehicle are independent objects, um, they're both going to be uh, wanting to follow Newton's first law. And so since the car or the truck here is stopping, the person wants to continue moving at that velocity. And so seatbelts uh, are going to help oppose that Newton's first law. Now it's also important to note that Newton's first law is directly related to inertia. And inertia uh, is a measure of an object's tendency to maintain its state of motion. And so the more massive an object is, the better it's going to be at following Newton's first law. Okay, let's get to Newton's second law. Newton's second law of motion can be best explained with this equation, F equals MA. And what this equation means is that the net force acting on an object is going to be equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration of the object. A lot of times you're going to see this symbol in front of the F, and that is a sigma, it's a Greek letter, and it means the sum of. And so we're referring to the combination of all the forces on an object. So that means if acceleration is going to occur, then the force must be equal to anything but zero. So how could we have a net force that is equal to a zero? Well, here's a good example. If somebody were to jump out of a plane, like a person skydiving, they're gradually going to increase their speed as they fall until they reach something called terminal velocity. And terminal velocity is going to be the absolute fastest or the max velocity a person can reach while falling. What happens at terminal velocity is that the force of gravity, I'm just going to label this Fg, is going to be exactly equal to the force of air resistance, which is going to be opposing that force of gravity. When those two forces are exactly equal to each other, the net force, or the sum of the forces here, is going to be equal to zero, and so no acceleration is going to occur. So what role does the mass of the object play in all of this? Well, if we look at the equation F equals MA, we can see that force and mass are directly related to each other. In other words, they're directly proportional. So if the mass of the object increases, that means the force required to accelerate the object is also going to increase. So on the other hand, you can think of mass and acceleration as being inversely proportional to each other. And what that means is that if the mass of the object goes up, as long as force remains the same, the acceleration of the object is going to go down. So here's an example. If you were to throw a football as hard as you possibly could, you could probably get it to go a pretty good distance in the air. Now if you're going to take a shot put, and again, throw it with the absolute most power you possibly can, 
same as you did with the football, you're probably not going to get it to go as far because the shot put has much more mass than the football. The greater the mass, the lower the acceleration. Okay, let's get to Newton's third law. Newton's third law is probably the most famous of all. And this is how it's usually stated. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. This is a very simplified version of Newton's third law. It's actually almost too simplified. And it actually kind of messes up our thinking of Newton's third law. So we're going to actually rephrase this in a little bit of a better way. So here's how we're going to phrase Newton's third law. Whenever an object exerts a force on a second object, the second object will exert an equal and opposite force on the first object. When working with Newton's third law, it's very important to understand that they ha there has to be two objects involved. So here's what this looks like. Uh, an astronaut here in outer space is going to experience zero gravity. And we have our astronaut here with this ball. And if this astronaut was here playing catch with another astronaut in space, as the astronaut were to exert a force on the ball to throw the ball, the ball would exert a force back on the astronaut in the opposite direction. And so since there's no friction here in space and the astronaut's essentially floating around, as soon as he started throwing that ball, he'd be pushed backwards as the ball would begin to accelerate. Now, Newton's second law is also going to play an effect here because the ball has much less mass than the astronaut, and so the ball would be moving much quicker than the astronaut would be uh, because the mass is less, so the acceleration would be greater on the ball. Okay, and let's look at just one more example. So here we have a close-up view of a car tire on the road. Now sometimes we take driving a car for granted. Uh, it's thanks to Newton's third law that the car actually is going to be able to move when we hit the gas pedal. So when you hit the gas pedal, your tire is going to exert a force onto the road. And the road is going to exert the exact same magnitude force uh, back on the tire. Now you may be thinking, wait, so how can the car move at all? Isn't this just a completely balanced tug-of-war where no one's going to win? Well, it's true that the forces are completely balanced, and they're in opposite directions. However, this is where, once again, F equals MA is going to come into uh, play. So we remember that the greater the mass, the lower the acceleration. And so mass plays a very significant role on how force is turned into acceleration. The force that the Earth exerts on your car is going to cause your car to accelerate forwards. It's going to start moving. However, the force that the car exerts on the earth is going to be so small because the mass of the earth is actually billions of times greater uh, than the car. Now, it's weird to think, but the earth will actually accelerate, uh, even though it's going to be such a small amount that it won't be significant at all. And those are Newton's three laws of motion.